I didn't lie. I just, uh, I said we're going to look at the second tip calculator, and we will, but I want to spend one more time, one more example of taking code that lives currently as part of the um, part of the uh, on click listener and move it to its own class. And the reason for that is, again, if we were building an application, and, and again, this is, this is a tip calculator, let's say we had a, a, an activity that showed where you could enter in the, uh, the uh, amount of the bill and it would show you the tip. We could also, on the same application, have a different activity that showed them a, a tip chart. That if it was $10 and you had fair service, this is how much the tip was, and like make a table. So we might want this calculation or other calculations to occur on a variety of different activities. And we certainly don't want to duplicate the code. Duplicating the code is taboo, right? We don't want to do it. We don't want to do it because it then makes it hard to maintain. Um, we're liable to forget when we go and change uh, something, to change it in a couple different places, and so on. So I think it's worthwhile talking about this and seeing sort of what we end up with. So we'll do that first, and then we'll look at the second. Look at the second example. Now to be sure, this is an extensive code, um, so we just want to make sure we understand the concept behind it. Okay, good. There we go. Okay, so right now if you notice, the code is in effectively an event handler, all right? Uh, or, uh, you know, a, a, a listener. Uh, that is code that, that listens for um, some user action and then does something. In this case, it's the button click. And because this is so simple, that's not horrible. All right? But if we were going to improve this a bit, we would want that tip calculation to be somewhere where it could be called from a variety of places. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class for tips. Could even maybe create a class for meals in which tip would be one attribute of it or one method that we could perform on it. But I'm going to keep it simple and create a Java class for meals. I'm sorry, for tips. It's a class. There's no super class. There's no interfaces. Blah, 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 blah. I'll click OK, and it gives us a empty shell of a class. Now, I'm going to put in there a function, and here's what's going to make this function a little bit better than having it in the event handler. Right now, the code in the event handler will work if we have the amount in a edit text field, and if we have a, um, if we have a, um, spinner control that has the uh, quality of the meal, and so on. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function that accepts two arguments. And it's going to return a double. Functions have several things associated with them. One of the things it has associated with them is a function name. Second thing it has associated with is a uh, list of arguments. The arguments think of those as being the inputs to the function. That's what the function needs to do its job. Everything the function needs should be given to it or should be contained somewhere within its own class. That notion is the notion of encapsulation. So in other words, we don't want a piece of this to live somewhere else. So, for example, the, the little if statements that look and say, well, if you, uh, if you uh, 
have poor service, you want to give 10% tip. If you have average service, 15%. Good service, 20%. Those percentages we're going to build in this class. Because if we ever had to change it, we would uh, only have to change it in this one place. So I'm going to accept, uh, I'm going to call the function calculate tip. By convention, we make the function names lowercase, the first word, lowercase. I specify the arguments. The arguments are going to be the things that we pass it. To calculate the tip in this particular example, we need a double that contains the amount, and we need an integer that contains the kind of service that we had. The way that we have set this up is um, we give one if it's, uh, or zero if it's poor service, one if it's okay service or average service, and then two if it's excellent service. The, bra the braces, of course, indicate sort of containing and It's giving me an error on this because I promised I would return a double and I haven't returned anything yet. So it's warning me of that. I'm going to go and copy the code over from the main activity and change it a bit. See if this has this. No, it doesn't. Rearrange code. I work with one tool where there's a way that you can automatically let it um, do the indenting for you so that when it reformat code, there you go. So that sets the braces to be indented properly. That's a nice tool to use because you may start out doing it correct and as time goes on you may add stuff in, get rid of lines and, and you get your indentation wrong. It's very useful to have your code indented correctly because that shows you what belongs with what. Okay, so I'm going to change this not to use the spinner control, but to use the argument that we're given. something like if it didn't if we didn't give one of the allowable levels we could throw an exception um, for those of you that are more familiar with Java that would be one cool thing that we could do in this so that if they didn't give one of these three legal values we could also use an enumeration and things like that but again we're keeping it pretty simple so I'm going to take the cost instead of being the cost it's going to be the arg amount and I'm going to return the value of the tip Okay, so now everything about the calculation of this tip is built within this class and built within this method. So therefore, um, if we were going to use this in a variety of our different activities, we would use the exact same calculation. If we decided later that, uh, gee, 10% is too high for poor service, we're going to knock it down uh, to 8%. Or if 20% is too low for excellent service, we're going to bump it up to 22% within our app. We only have one place to do it, regardless of how many times this object was used, or regardless of how many times this class was used. Every activity, then, will not have its own code for the calculation. It will get it from this class. 
What we have to do here then is actually have to make the object and call it. So, I'm going to create an object, tip t equals new tip. That creates one of my tip objects. I then can say that the result, or the tip, equals t dot calc tip, it's actually tips. Help tip and it tells me what the arguments are. It needs to give an amount and the service, so I will give it the amount that is contained in the variable cost and a level of service which is include in service. So I get the value of the tip, I format it and I display it. Notice now that None of the actual calculation, oh, that's called, well, I already have something called T, so I'll say um, my tip. The calculation isn't mixed with the user interface. The activity is the user interface. To be sure, it's connected to the user interface, but it's connected in a way that the event handler, the listener, doesn't do the actual work itself. It just gathers the parameters from the UI and passes them to the object so that the object performs it. This is a hallmark sort of of, of all good programming. That there's a clean separation between your interface code, which defines the user interface, defines on some level the actions that are going to be taken in the user interface, but the actual work, the actual business logic or problem domain logic is carried on somewhere else. All right. So again, I could write any number of activities that all did this sort of calculation and I'd be good to go. So let's run it and make sure it still works. Not sure why it's so giant, but I'm going to close this out. Second class in a row, something didn't work, I simply close it out and open it back up and it worked again. It's great. All right, so I put in that we had a $120 meal, our tip was, our, our service was average, calculate the tip, it still shows us the right, right value. 
Again, what's the advantage of this? You know, it worked before and it works now. It works now, uh, the way it works now is better because we now have a place for that code to be. And we can call that code from wherever. Now, this is a very, very, very simple example. But in larger applications, you're going to have many, many, many different objects uh, at work. And each object is going to have its own properties and methods and so on. And um, the fact that you'll be able to um, call the same code regardless of what activity is being run, what user interface is being run, um, is, is a big plus. Notice how this code right now doesn't depend on where the data is coming from. It doesn't care where you get that double, where you get that integer for service. You call this code, you give it that. It doesn't matter if it comes from a text box or a slider or what, all right? It will take those values, do the calculations, and return the results. By the same token, it doesn't matter where you send that data, all right? Um, it returns results, and the UI can decide where it wants to display the data, all right? So that's this one. Let me close out of this. And as promised, we will look at the Deedle example from the Deedle textbook. So if I run this, I have this where I can put the amount of the meal in. And it automatically calculates the tip. I can also go forward and backward and dynamically change the, the kind of tip that you get. All right, let's look at the code for this. to start on this. Let's start with the layout. And again, you can view it in graphical mode or you can view it in the text mode. This is a grid layout. All right? Which means things will be laid out in like a table. Let's look at this and then we'll look and we'll compare that to what we see on the page. The first thing is an edit text field for the amount. Notice it's layout column zero, but it extends across two columns. So this, if we can imagine this as a table, it's a, it's a four rows and two columns. This goes across columns one and two, or actually zero and one. This thing here goes in column zero. This goes in column one. This goes in column zero. This goes in column one. This goes in column zero. This goes in column one. We have an ID for it. We say that you can only enter certain digits into it. We say the maximum length is six. Allows you to pay, um, what, up to $999,000 for a meal. That's, you know, they must really supersize that one. All right. Uh, EMS, I don't know what that means. Let's look it up. What is the Android EMS attribute? Simply the font size. Uh, and then it goes on to dis, uh, 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 explain it. It looks like it's an M, much like the M in web design, where M in web design in a CSS language is, is how much it is emphasized. In other words, how many times it is the normal size. 
So if you say 2m, it's twice as big as normal. And we say 2m here. Actually, we say 10m. So I don't know if that seems right. But at any rate, uh, we can play with that um, and see it. Text you. Another text view. A seek bar. This allows us to give a, a bar that scrolls between zero and whatever we define the max to be. We define the max in this case to be 30. So you're not going to tip more than 30%. Um, progress of 15 is the initial value of it. If you notice when we fired up the app, the initial value of this was 15. Now, one thing I don't like about this seek bar is, unless you write some code to handle it, the seek bar doesn't show you what the value is automatically. You have to write code to do that. And that's what we put in this text view. All right, The text view takes a text version of the value of the seek bar and shows it to you so you know how much the value is. Otherwise, you'd have to guess and say, well, that's halfway between 0 and 30. And, well, you'd even have to know that 30 is the maximum, right? But this shows you what the, what the numeric value is associated with the seek bar. Then we have text views for the word tip, text views for the word um, do, 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 um, total, and the actual total and tip amount. Some of the attributes I didn't really cover um, about this. Uh, we'll skip those for now in, in, in an effort to try to understand the code uh, on a little higher level. Now, a couple things that you'll notice. Android ATR text appearance medium for that text view. What that relates to is This refers to a style element. And in this case, this relates to um, a theme that would have um, the display property set for that text area. And that theme will automatically get uh, applied to this. If we look up what this theme does, it will tell you that theme allows us to set certain default properties of those things. 
I have to confess I'm not real familiar with this theming, so we're going to skip that and we'll come back to that probably on Tuesday about the theme color for that. All right. We have our strings in the string file for those things. We have our dimensions in the dimension file. We have colors defined here. I believe those are associated with the theme as well. Result background. Let's look in the of that is defined as result background. That grabs the color from the color file. So that's how we make the um, that's how we make the color of those result fields be that particular color. The thing I have to look up is that one and get some more detail on that and some of the other uh, display issues. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll do some research on that and come back uh, on Monday uh, concerning that. So the colors contain colors. And again, what's the advantage of doing that? It's almost like putting it in a style sheet, right? If I were to change the result background to another color, let's change it to a very pale green. So I can go something like DDFFDD. When I run this now, Everywhere that has a background of background result will have that green instead of that sort of golden before. What did that? The fact that I have in the layout file for the color of this guy, at color result background. And then I have in the colors file, the colors XML file, I can define what that result background means. Again, notice that there are multiple icons for this. There, and therefore, different screen densities. The higher the screen density, the sharper the uh, icon is going to be. The bigger the file is going to be and the sharper that it will be, so it will show up good on um, even a, a high-density pixel display. All right, let's look at the actual Java code now. All right, it's a kind of activity. It extends app compat activity. We create a currency formatter and a percent formatter. All right, that is simply a tool that will allow you to neatly, uh, neatly um, format the currency and neatly format. Um, the percentage. I believe that would be tied to the local settings of the device, so it would format your currency differently if you said you were in France versus United States. What does static mean and what does final mean? Final is a constant. Final is, is a constant in the sense if you declare something as a final, you can't change it. Static means that we're going to be calling things that don't require an instance of the class. We can simply say, um, notice that we don't anywhere in here say new equals new such and such. So this currency format is really pointing to a class, not to, a, um, not to an object. We've defaulted a couple parameters here, the bill amount and the percentage. We create our text views. This is where the user can um, shows the formatted bill amount, the tip amount, finally the total. Excuse me. On create, we grab references to all these. By using
one view by ID. And we set the text of the tip and the text of the uh, total using the currency formatter. Now, we actually have two actions that we're interested in here. We're interested in an action if the user types something in the amount box, and we're interested in a different action if the user slides the seat bar. All right. Now, this is a little confusing because these objects, these are instance variables. These are objects that we're creating, um, but they're actually after the code. And I imagine the reason that they do this is because of the kind of objects that these are. I create a private final on seek uh, bar change listener called seek bar listener. And it is equal to a new instance of seek bar listener. And I actually put the code for that class right in here. This is what's known as an anonymous class. I'm not creating a class and giving it a name. I'm creating something that is of type on seek bar listener, and I'm specifying all the code right here. Now, let's look at the other one first, the text watcher. text watcher, because this is an interface, when we create an instance of the interface, we have to supply the functions that that interface requires. So we have to supply, in this case, three functions. In the case of the on-click listener, we only specified one, the on-click. Here we have to specify on text changed, after text changed, and before text changed. So we can do something as a user is making a change. We could do something before the text changes or after it changes. In this case, we don't have any code for after and before text change. We still need those function declarations in there because we're creating something of type text watcher. And let's look up what a text watcher is. It's an interface. Public interface. So we're creating this object that's going to serve as a listener in a different way. I don't know if I like doing it this way or not. All right, but it's a way to do it. In this way, we create a text watcher by saying new text watcher, and we put all the code for the text watcher right there between the curly brackets. So we're creating an object that implements that interface. We're calling it amount edit text watcher. It implements the interface text watcher, but we don't have a class associated with this text watcher. This is known as an anonymous class because we define the code not in a class, but right here as part of the creation of that text watcher. Now, if I don't have one of these three methods, let's see, I delete this guy. I'm going to get an error. It says, anonymous class derived from text watcher must be declared abstract or implement the abstract method. This is the exact same thing that we happened when I got rid of the onClick event from the application before, when we implemented the onClick listener. So we have to have that in there in order for this to be recognized as a class that is derived from text watcher, the interface. It's a little goofy. This is an instance variable. It's just defined a little further below because there's code in it. 
And the code is created not by creating a class or anything like that, but by putting the code smack dab in the middle of the creation of this. Now, you need those three even if you don't have code for two of them in this case. Let's look to see what we do if the text has changed. If the text has changed, first of all, we make sure that the value in the text box is valid. All right. Make sure that the uh, amount in the text box is valid. Now here's an interesting thing. We've already said that you can only put numbers in there, but we perform that check anyhow. That's just good coding to sort of have those redundant checks. We're parsing it and we're seeing if there's a double in there or not, and if there's not a double, we throw an error. That way, if someone happened to mess up our code later on and allowed the full keyboard and people could put garbage in there, it's still not going to blow up. So that's a good, good, good programming practice. So we're going to get the bill amount, which is an instance variable on the class. Pardon me? Why is that? Oh, yeah, good point. If you're using voice instead of that. Excellent point. Parse double S to string. S is the character sequence that this gets. Remember, these are methods that are defined as part of the framework, and therefore, when the, the text changes, this function gets called and puts what we have just entered in that text view into the parameter S. So we try to make a double out of it. If it is double, if it is not double, rather, we throw an exception and we zero things out and display um, nothing for the amount. We then set the text for current, uh, on the currency format, the bill amount. So, in other words, we set the value in there and we format it for currency. Notice I just kept hitting numbers. All right. It goes and it formats. I guess the six include the commas and the, the period and the dollar sign. So it's not up to $100,000. But as we go and enter it in, it formats it and shows it as a currency. Then it calls calculate. And calculate is sort of like the function I wrote, because in this case, remember, we're going to recalculate based on two different things. We're going to recalculate, first of all, based on if they change the amount. Secondly, we're going to uh, recalculate if they've moved the slider. So, if they've, regardless of which they've done, we change, we call calculate, and calculate is over here. We format the percentage. We calculate the tip. And we calculate the total bill, and then we display the results in there. Now, what about the seek bar? Seek bar also creates a listener in the same manner through an anonymous class. The seek bar has three methods also that you need to implement. And again, you need to implement all three of them because it's an interface. And interfaces, you have to implement all the functions that are declared. In this case, two of them we're not using. On start, tracking, on stop. We are, however, implementing this guy, which is on progress changed. We get from this, the seek bar that was actually changed, in case we need that. We also get um, whether 
what the, what the progress is set at. Remember we said this goes from 0 to 30. So we take that progress and we divide it by 100 to get the percentage. So if it was at 20, it changes 20 to 20 over 100 or 0.2. There's a third argument that gets passed in. It says from user. I would expect that would mean it would, did, did, did the scroll bar change because the user scrolled it or did my program somehow scroll it? Because you could write code to dynamically change the scroll bar. All right. So I load up the percentage variable and I call the same calculate function, which again goes and takes the amount from uh, the um, value that was entered in the text. It takes the amount that was uh, calculated, it calculates the tip, and it adds them up and it displays it. The other thing it does is it sets the percent text view. And that is this little thing right here. Without that, you'd be sliding this back and forth, but I have no idea what the actual percentage was. All right, so it sets that view as part of the process. So any questions about this? All right, let's go, and last thing I want to do today is I want to create a, another resource file. I'm going to create, if we were doing this, a French strings file. I have a question. Okay. Sure. For the uh, pictures, for the icon, how do you specify what's, which one's for which screen density? Or does it just know automatically? It, it looks like it labels next to it. Yeah. I believe if you drag an image into here, it will look and it will size. It will look at it based on the size, and you can look up. Um, So, all right, for your launch icons, so, so if it's 48 by 48, it's considered medium density. If it's 72 by 72, high density, uh, 96 by 96, extra high density, 144 by 144, and so on. So that's how you would tell. You'd create one of each of those sizes. I think, and I'll have to double check this, um, but I think there's a way if you create one, it will resize it to the other sizes. So you'd create the biggest one, and it would go and then create the other ones for you. All right, let's create a resource file for this. So I'm going to go in, and in values, I'm going to say new, and I'm going to say resource file. Now, I want it to be my strings, so I'll type in strings, and I want it to be based on I thought there was a country distinct from the language, but we'll go. I guess not. We use a country code. And mobile country code will be, let's look it up for French. This is a locale, not a mobile country code. My mistake. Locale. That's the one I want. So I'll create locale. And there we go. And we can pick. And we want this for French. French. So now we have an XML string for French. So what am I going to do? 
I'm going to go copy these and I'm just going to do maybe one of these in Google Translate. Enter amount. feeling that's a different kind of tip in French because it says calculateur de point. I think they mean a tip like the tip of a pencil, but I don't know. I'm not going to go worry about that. Now, I have to go and I have to set my locale on this to uh, France. So I'm going to go into my system settings on here. I didn't want that. And let's see where. Here we go. Custom locale. All right, locale list. Let's scroll down. And I'm going to pick French. Drum roll, please. I go and run this app. Calculateur de point, saisir le montant, and so on. In addition, notice that the currency is formatted differently. I don't know if you can see that real well. It is, instead of being dollars, like something, point something, it actually uses a comma to separate the, the numbers from uh, the, the fractional numbers. And the thing, the little thing behind it, it's a little hard to see, but it's a symbol for a euro, I believe. Well, that does not seem to be displaying correctly, but it probably should be the symbol for the euro instead of the symbol for the dollar. Um, so that's a great feature of this. This is something that you do not have to code. You simply supply the file. Now notice that when we created this, if we said we wanted to create a values file, we can create a values file for any of these different resource qualifiers. By resource qualifiers, what does that mean? It means that we can say these are the devices that get the, these string values instead, or dimension values, or colors, or anything that we want to. So I could create colors, based on locale, 
and create a different color scheme for French. So, just for laughs, I'm going to put in what would be a good color for French? Let's do a pale blue. Alright, so now I run it. And not only does it get the words from the word file, or the strings file, It gets the colors from the color file. So, locale, screen size, screen density, all those things are valid resource qualifiers. Layout direction. So you could have different colors if it's oriented horizontally versus vertically, if you wanted to. All right? Um, you could have, depending on the screen width, all right? Um, you could have, uh, depending on the screen height, the screen size, the orientation, um, the UI mode, whether it's in night mode or not, all right? My phone's been bugging me about night mode. I don't even know what that means, but I have an alarm set that's like, you're in night mode. Do you want to check? I'm like, I don't know. Do I? You know. But you can set night mode, which is apparently between certain parameters you set on your system, and so on down the line. You can even change it based on the Android version. So all these things are available for you to customize, and you can do this without having to create any code. All right. That's the big value of having all these values stored in an XML file. You can simply point to the XML file or create a separate XML file. By the resource qualifier, you define when that resource file is used. That's all you have to do. Now, what happens if we had a, a device that was German, let's say, and we didn't have a German device? Well, it would take the default then. So whatever we had in our strings.xml file, like in our case, English, it would use English. So it would only use the things that had. So if you're translating your app and you know that you're not worried about, you know, or you know that you can't translate it into every language in the world, right, you could, if you were in North America, maybe translate it into English, Spanish, and French. That would cover, you know, U.S., Mexico, and uh, uh, parts of Canada, all right? And other places, if someone in, you know, Germany or, or um, you know, Russia or whatever would view it, then it would show the, the strings to be in, in English because that would be the default that you would create for this. I will look more about that layout stuff because I have to admit I'm a little weak on that, and we will talk about that on Tuesday of next week. Are there any questions? All right. I will post these examples, and... Uh, We'll see you next week. Is anyone staying? Okay, see you next week. about the only thing is um, the downfall would be the downfall would be this let's say I had let's say I was playing tic-tac-toe all right now I click on each of the boxes in the tic-tac-toe game all right pretty much the same thing happens for each box the, the logic to process a box in tic-tac-toe is going to be the same I'm going to look to see um, is it, some, is it something that's already been selected? If, if so, then I'm not going to let them select it. If it hasn't been selected, I'm going to look to see whose turn it was. If it's X's turn, I'm going to turn it into an X. If it's O's turn, I'm going to turn it into an O. Then I'm going to see if someone won. All right? That's going to be the same thing for all nine 
of, of uh, well, let me think this through. You can still use an anonymous class for that. Um, really not. Um, I guess there's a clarity issue if you think that the, that code is confusing. Because you can even do that, because you're creating an object from the anonymous class, and I could apply that object to as many things as I wanted to. So I was originally thinking if I create use an anonymous class, I could only apply it to one thing, but that's not the case. So yeah, I'm not, I can't really think of any disadvantages. I, I don't, I am not crazy about that style of coding, so I usually avoid it, but. Is that or something? I, it, it's one of those things that, um, <laughs> 